This video is sponsored by Raycon. Right, so over the last month or so, I imagine we've all been bombarded with advertising for Blumhouse's new schlock slasher bait Megan, an uncanny valley evil doll movie seemingly made for the TikTok generation that I respect doesn't even try to hide its campy conceit. I haven't seen it, but at the time of writing, now that it is released, I've heard great things about it wholeheartedly committing to its premise. However, I honestly have absolutely no desire to see it because evil doll movies are really not my cup of coffee. I typically try to avoid these types of movies when I can, yet ever since Annabelle exploded in popularity almost a decade ago, it's difficult to ignore the repeated attempts to reignite this niche 80s subgenre, which includes two competing attempts to reboot the series that practically started it all. Hell, somehow we have five of these Robert movies that keep popping up in my Netflix recommendations that just sort of exist without any fanfare. That said, my attention seems to be constantly drawn to a particular particular evil doll movie and its relatively recent sequel that has persistently pestered me every time I open the horror category on any rental store or discount seal. Maybe it's fate, maybe it's stubbornness, or maybe the release of Megan has made me morbidly curious to get it out of my head, but knowing full well of the boy's big hyped up WTF moment which seems to be the word of mouth selling point for horror these days, I decided to finally give it my undivided attention to explore just why it seems to have retained and always their nothing special home movie reputation. Perhaps it's purely a just me situation, but the boy sits pretty firmly next to every other aggressively mediocre, modestly successful conjuring insidious spin-off about supernatural possession set in a big old empty house. You could argue its old school simplistic concept, which includes several wild twists and turns, does exemplify Hollywood polluting the genre with commercially accessible products manufactured solely around trends and tick boxes that ultimately dilute the horrifying potential buried deep within them. However, this point could be better exemplified through the film's director, William Brent Bell, who has made a bit of a career out of conceptually interesting ideas that ultimately suffer from painfully unremarkable execution. He has a good eye for strong novel thumbnail and poster-friendly visuals that cater perfectly to the zeitgeist they're designed for, such as Separation, Where, The Devil Inside, and Stay Alive about a cursed video game that I would love to cover but cannot obtain a legitimate copy anywhere in my country. In fact, he recently directed the Orphan prequel, which is right up his alley because it's an evil creepy child concept with an utterly bonkers payoff similar to The Boy, and I've heard it's a prequel that is legitimately decent, so let me know in the comments if it's a topic that interests you. Anyway, now that I've established the backdrop, despite all the cynicism I've put across, please do bear in mind that it comes from a place of uh, frustrated love, let's say, because is, as you'll see, the boy has some insanely twisted potential. If you want to help me out, please leave a cheeky wee comment below with a side of like and subscribe, including your requests on what I should cover next. And lastly, here are a few words from this video sponsor, Raycon. New Year, New Year's, now that we've shaken off the rust, it's time to get back into our vibe intensive routines with the help of Raycon's everyday earbuds, which look, feel and sound better than ever. I've been wearing these bad boys all throughout the holidays thanks to their brilliant three distinct sound profiles that allow me to adapt to what I'm listening to. Maybe you're like me and trying to get back into the gym or sports, so switching to bass sound allows me to blast Muse in all their electrifying glory, while switching to pure sound is perfect for Sufjan Stevens' soulful vocals during leisurely walks, and then you have balanced sound which is great for watching crap like my videos. Raycons offer 8 hours of playtime and a 32 hour battery life, and with optimized gel tips for that perfect in-ear fit, not only do they remain comfortable during extensive play, but they do not budge. Raycons also include noise isolation and awareness mode, which means you can use isolation to maintain immersion when listening or watching your favorite things, and use awareness mode to keep yourself safe when traveling or just when you need to chat to someone without disconnecting completely. However, best of all, Raycons give you all these quality features plus more at half the price of other premium audio brands, and with over 50,000 five-star reviews, maybe 2023 is the year you finally join the party. Simply click the link in the description box below or go to buyraycon.com Ryan for 15% off your Raycon purchase and let me know what you think.
Deck. The boy tells the story of Greta Evans, a forlorn young American lady who relocates to the UK to take on a nanny role on behalf of Mr. and Mrs. Heelshire before they embark on a vacation for an undisclosed amount of time. The catch, however, is that the Heelshire's son Brahms is actually a porcelain doll, who must be cared for in the exact same way you would an actual living child, with Greta having rules imposed upon her which she must strictly adhere to. Initially, the boy Boy begins as an awkward, uncomfortable watch, as Greta adjusts to the bewildering circumstances placed upon her, shrugging it off as an eccentric, senile elderly couple simply seeking comfort to fill the void in their lonely, isolated lives, a sentiment we gradually discover Greta can relate to. Your mind immediately begins to wonder what exactly is going on. Are the couple just a bit odd? Are they hiding something sinister? Is the doll haunted? Is this a Chucky situation and the doll's a manic serial? killer? Oh hell, is this going to be some ritualistic murder cult conspiracy? Honestly, it does a good job keeping you compelled with the mystery, and you can kiss my ass if you think you knew where this was all going. After the Heelshires leave for their vacation visibly distraught and heartbroken, we do start to get a tragic understanding of their backstory in the form of the exposition dumping love interest Malcolm, a local delivery driver who has stalked the Heelshire home for several years. Malcolm reveals that the real Brahms died 20 years ago on his 8th birthday during a house fire, and so his surviving doll has become a coping mechanism for the Heelshires who have never overcome the grief of their son's death. It helps recontextualize the eerie atmosphere encompassing the Heelshire home. Suddenly, this cold, empty, creaky house becomes less haunting and more somber. There's a very frail quietness to the setting, like your interactions must be treated sensitively as to not disturb the delicate, troubled nature of the home's history. It's not exactly a unique atmosphere, and for the most part, I felt kind of bored and unaffected by its presentation, but it does project a sense of character that emotionally reflects upon Greta as we learn more about her own troubled backstory. As a side note, the limited on-screen time given to Mr. and Mrs. Heelshire shows how strong their performances are at conveying their strained efforts to hold back their anguish. With Mrs. Heelshire showing angst and frustration at Greta's difficulty engaging with the doll, and Mr. Heelshire completely contrasting my expectations with the fact he played Bishop Brennan in Father Ted. If you ever try to bullshit me like that again. I will rip off your arms. Greta and Malcolm, on the other hand, are just not as interesting. Malcolm is practically one note, but Rupert Evans still manages to make him somewhat charming, whereas Lauren Cohen's Greta doesn't convey much of anything besides the essentials of her character. I actually ended up comparing her to Jesse Buckley's screen presence and performance in Men, where all the quiet downtime and isolation needs some emotional weight to sustain your attention, and Cohen doesn't really have it. To be fair, the doll is technically the star of the show, just broodingly sitting staring at Greta with some voyeuristic camera work to convey the impression she's always being watched, eyes on her all the time. The thing worth noting is that compared to other evil doll movies, I appreciate that Brahms aesthetically fits the setting instead of looking hideous for the sake of effect. It looks precisely like you'd expect a child like Brahms to own, thus grounding it in realism, especially when taking into account the tragic backstory he symbolises. Frankly, I can't really add anything beyond, yes, he's creepy, he does his job. He randomly moves when Greta isn't looking, instilling the fear that he's alive or possessed, which is compounded by the strange creaks and childlike noises around the house and the nightmares Greta keeps experiencing. It's at the halfway point where I dreaded that this was all the movie would be, but to my surprise, it actually changes tone and redirects your expectations when it moves into psychological thriller territory when we finally get the full context of Greta's backstory. We learn that Greta escaped from America to distance herself from her abusive ex-boyfriend Cole, who is trying to track her down and ignoring his restraining order, adding to that feeling of oppression within the house as Greta is is essentially in hiding. However, the real heartbreak is when we discover Greta had a miscarriage after being assaulted by Cole. Thus, she deeply empathizes with the Heelshire's despair, and her neglect for Brahms begins to feel less like a haunting and more like a purpose. 
after she begins following the strict rules to care for Brahms like he were real, assuming his spirit truly is within the doll, suddenly the hauntings begin to diminish, with Malcolm growing concerned at Greta's troubled behaviour. For Greta, she's making peace with her grief, and reigniting meaning in her life after suffering stagnation from an abusive relationship that resulted in death. But from the outside looking in, we can see why Malcolm thinks Greta is growing unstable. I mean, everything we've experienced up to this point is purely from Greta's subjective and thus potentially unreliable point of view. This is why I'm surprised it paints such a compelling picture. It's not the most engaging watch, and it sure as hell isn't scary, but nonetheless, the mystery holds together long enough that it all unravels in the climax with intended effect. So, brace yourself. So, the main problem I think the boy suffers from is more structural than pacing. It changes direction fairly abruptly without much anticipation. For example, there's a lot of waiting around for things to happen, and the time between the hauntings and Greta accepting the doll is possessed is fairly quick. This comes in hand with the unexpected arrival of her ex Cole, who we know is a monster, but he isn't around long enough to sell the distress he puts Greta under, thus his arrival doesn't hit the tense high note that it should. The other the scene I think that's misplaced within the film is the deaths of Mr. and Mrs. Heelshire. It feels like this should be a significantly more tragic and surprising reveal, but it happens in between the hauntings and just doesn't align with the pace at that moment. The context of their deaths is that the Heelshires are attempting to pawn Brahms off to another carer so they can end their tormented misery. It actually comes from a place of guilt rather than grief when we finally understand just what the hell is going on. After Cole finally shatters the doll, awakening something else within the house. The truth is, there is nothing supernatural happening, as suddenly the real adult Brahms arrives with his mighty chest hair, having been living in the fucking walls this entire time. This is a twist that would make M. Night Shyamalan cream himself. The Heelshires do subtly allude to Brahms always being there, so it wasn't an impossibility, but you have to really think outside the box given the film indirectly maintains its twist with its generic and unambitious delivery. In the moment, it's a genuinely powerful payoff, but once the dust has settled after he kills Joel and a Scooby-Doo chase ensues, it's obviously coming from a very contrived place. Brahms is basically a psychopath who murdered another child when he was young, and the fire was what I think a hoax concocted by the Heelshires to protect their son by faking his death, reinforced by them explicitly choosing Greta to be his mate before they off themselves. The whole family was more or less messed up, and the film ends with Greta killing Brahms, only for a sequel bait ending to reveal the doll being repaired. Now, four years later along came the sequel, which you'd think would be pointless given we know the twist, but oh you haven't seen anything yet, it manages to get even more ridiculous. Just so I can get to the point, while the original gets props for being an okay if tedious atmospheric chiller, the sequel is an utterly soulless slog to sit through. This time, oh my god, would you believe it, we're dealing with the theme of trauma again, as the setup of the story sees a mother and son called Lisa and Jude get terrorised by two masked burglars, prompting the father Sean to relocate them to a country home close to the Hillshire Manor. While it does give the film another emotional stake, it's presented as more hollow than the doll itself, which is mysteriously discovered by Jude, buried but fully repaired outside the Heelshire Manor. The unique thing established about Jude's character is that since the ordeal, he's remained mute, and ends up trying to communicate to his parents that the doll needs to be cared for in the same way Greta was told. But despite this being a big plot point that they make a fairly noticeable deal about, it just sort of drops this without much acknowledgement other than, ah, oh, Jude can talk again! oh my god, isn't it a miracle? The doll still has that uncanny presence, but they really oversell it this time by actually showing you the doll physically move when nobody is looking, cheapened further by replacing the nightmares Greta had about the doll to Lisa having nightmares about the burglars. Now, you're probably asking yourself, wasn't it alluded to in the first film that nothing supernatural was happening? Well, the sequel kinda retcons this by revealing that yes, the doll is in fact supernatural this time, as it tries 
tries to influence Jude to the point he starts dressing like it, which is funnier than it has any right to be. At the same time, however, it actually addresses the question from the original of how the doll moves about. Discovering that Brahms is real makes you assume he's the one moving the doll about when nobody is looking, but that doesn't make any practical sense when you think about it. Whereas in the sequel, we're introduced to new insights from the form of another exposition dumping character called Joseph, played by Ralph Einson, whose mere existence in the film makes it much more tolerable. He's a nothing character until the climax, simply existing to be brooding and delivering all the same information you learn in the original, including the fact that Greta did kill Brahms, but ah, no, 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 no. We know Brahms is alive because we saw him remake the doll at the end of the first movie. Ah, oh, but this movie likes to throw you with a fucking curveball. Honestly, this goes beyond Shyamalan. This is a Saw level plot twist in that it's so impressively preposterous and yet fits perfectly in the place. After the doll nearly kills Sean's friend's asshole kid, Sean learns from some random fucking guy in a hospital waiting room while Lisa does so through Google, that the doll was passed through a lineage of owners who each fell victim to the child who inherited it. In other words, it takes this supernatural plot point from Sinister, in that the doll is cursed to make the owning child a violent psychopath, which was the case when Brahms then killed a girl when he was young, and now the same thing is happening to Jude. Joseph is then revealed to be the one who repaired the doll, having been possessed into following its orders and ensuring it found a new owner after Brahms died. Now, if you're still with me, I will say it does recontextualize Brahms as a victim to the doll's evil influence than him just being some evil child at birth, but it actually makes it less scarier than it just being the binality of evil. Sean and Lisa then rescue Jude by trying to destroy the doll, which turns into this weird CG monster abomination thing that then kills Joseph and the family decides to fuck off back to London where they were because to hell with the countryside they'd rather take their chances with burglars. Oh, I guess they've overcome their trauma. I don't give a shit. The movie then obviously has the balls to set up another sequel by implanting the curse in Brahms' mask, but that's not going to happen because this movie died to death both critically and commercially. William Brent Bell really seems to have passion for this idea because he's clearly convinced there's something to this by apparently trying to get this to be a run it off trilogy by bringing the real Brahms back into the equation. The thing is, however, if this were a Blumhouse product, Bell would probably get exactly what he wanted, because regardless of quality, there is clearly a sizable market for these types of movies. Yet, there is no way in hell he would be getting $10 million a pop to make another one of these things. 